Well, let's turn to J.K. Rowling. By the way, I had said Rowling for years, but she calls herself Rowling. <laughs> okay, like Rowling on a river. Anyway, um, we've, that's what she looked like when she was your age, by the way, <coughs> which I find humorous. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, we read her today Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, called in the British edition Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I almost ordered that and insisted that they be shipped in from Britain so that it would have philosopher in the title, um, but it would have been a lot more expensive for you, so I didn't do that. Anyway, um, yeah, what are some philosophical themes that you identified in this song? Yeah. Socialism. Socialism. Oh, also. Uh, the wizards are the fourth one, the bubbles are the proletariat, the Oh, the muggles are the proletariat and the magic folk are the bourgeoisie. That's an interesting way of taking it. And in fact, I do think one of the main philosophical themes is a sort of two level conception. There really is a two-level thing that runs all the way throughout this book quite generally, right? Between the muggles and the magic folk. And so the question is really, what do they represent and what does that division signify? Here's one way you might think about it. Um, the manifest image is something like the muggle world. It's your world and my world. But then what's really going on underneath, <coughs> hidden from most of us, now it's not a scientific image here, it's a sort of a magical image, right? There's this different kind of thing, and the scientists here, the ones who supposedly know what's going on and have the big theory, those are the wizards and witches, those are the ones who actually understand this magical image and can operate within it. And so that's an interesting transformation. It's like there's this two-level theory, there's this ordinary world of everyday experience, and then there's this hidden world, but in this case, yeah, it's not a world, microparticles and energy fields and things like this. Instead, it's a world of goblins and witches and warlocks and unicorns and basically every darn mythological creature you can imagine. Um, in fact, one person came to my office and said, this is like a grab bag of archetypes. It's like, you know, what, what are things that have been talked about and written about but don't really exist? Put them in the book. <laughs> and it is a bit like that. It's a rather messy, magical image. But by the way, notice that there is a kind of interesting correspondence between the subjects offered at Hogwarts and the real sciences, herbology in place of biology, or potions in place of chemistry, and so on. Alchemy is taken seriously as a subject. Uh, divination instead of astronomy, or, you know, sort of astrological type stuff, and so on. There's a weird kind of almost replacing the scientific image one by one with this magical force. Are there other themes? That, oh, there's one other thing I wanted to say about that, but maybe I'll, it'll come up in a conversation. Other things. Yeah. Good versus evil, absolutely. Norms are all throughout this book, which is part of the reason it's what we're ending the semester reading. Okay? Good versus evil is the big dynamic throughout the book. And in that respect, actually, it's interesting to link it to this two level conception, because the is's and the ought's are reversed. The muggles seem to be the one who are unaware of this grand struggle between good and evil and aren't really paying it any attention. Their lives seem to consume by selfishness for the most part. But the magical folk, they're the ones who are actually fighting this battle between good and evil. So here the norms are actually in that hidden level, not the manifest level. So in that way it's just like a, a weird kind of inversion of the problem we've been talking about most of the term. The underlying reality is one which really does have good and evil as intimate parts of it, and it's the surface everyday world that's sort of strangely lacking in normativity, and so it is like good and evil is a big conflict throughout the book, and yet the is's and the ought's sort of occupy reverse places, which I find intriguing. But yeah, we've got good versus evil here. We've got virtues and vices. Who are examples of virtue in this book? Good Dumbledore, but who else? Yeah, I mean, Harry himself. Um, what about vices? Yeah, Malfoy. What, yeah, well, Voldemort himself, right? Of course, you must not be made. <laughs> uh, but no, it's very important. One very important theme in this book is actually it's really important to name things by their right names. Um, justice and injustice. We see examples of injustice here all throughout the book. Really. What are some prominent examples? How. Um, Yes. Exactly. Harry's treated very unfairly by tech universities. Uh, other examples of injustice. Yeah. Good. The way State treats Harry, that seems very unfair. Uh, it's as if you walked in the first day of a philosophy class, and I say, you, tell me about Aristotle, Aristotle's theory of the soul. And it's like, this is my first day for philosophy, what am I doing? <laughs> Um, but yeah, exactly. It's very unfair what he does to Harry. What are some other examples of unfairness? Yeah? 
Yeah, pure love versus the mixed love thing, right? So certain people seem very hostile to those who are, you know, only part magical uh, in their inheritance, in not in their abilities, and so on. Oops, I'm revealing my hand, sorry. <laughs> uh, other themes, yes? Oh, I was just going to comment on the justice and injustice. Oh, yeah, please. The system for the houses, it's really arbitrary. The system for the houses, okay, yeah, right. I mean, we both got the sorting hat, and who knows what it's doing. Right? Is it being fair or unfair? That we really have no insight into that. So that seems arbitrary in a lot of ways. But also the way the points are awarded at the end, in a certain intuitive sense, you feel as if you know it's it, it, it's just. And yet it's as if, aha, well, the final grades for this course have been computed, and the final points have been awarded, they're all on canvas. But now I'm going to make certain adjustments. <laughs> And then I start pointing to people who are favorites of mine and say, You! You get an extra 20 points! <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, so the Gryffindor is like, Oh, yeah, yeah, but think about everybody else in that hall and how they're feeling. They're like, Wait, something happened? And I don't even know what it was. And you're just taking this radical discrepancy between these scores and inverting it. It's as if I say, That person who has a 50 and is failing the course, that guy gets an extra 50 points because I like him. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, you get a lot of things here that are raising these issues about justice and injustice. Other themes. Yes? Uh, moral relativism and the Ubermensch. Moral relativism and the Ubermensch. Ooh, excellent. Okay, how do you see that? I just thought it was like, it seems pretty arbitrary who is magical and who's not because we have two people that aren't magical and they still have magical offspring. It seems that society is like evolving in a way, and that maybe, it's not really talked about that much, but maybe in the future everyone's a wizard. I don't know. Right, right. It seems like, 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 a, like that wizards are inherently better than muggles in a way because they have this like power. And so it's, at some point, you know, they can like, they'll supplant muggles. I don't know, that's kind of what right. I thought. Okay, yeah, it, that, that, all right, that's interesting. Certain people have certain powers, and it is as if some people are somehow supermen, right? They've got these abilities. And at one point, there's an attempt at a genetic explanation, but it doesn't really amount to much, because she seems to say it's a dominant gene, and that, nevertheless, it can be recessive, and two, <laughs> uh, non-magical people can have a magical child, and, and so, yeah, the biology here is maybe, well, it's herbology, I guess, I don't know, it doesn't make much sense, really. Uh, but yes, there's something strange about that. Some people have these extra powers. And so it puts them in a, se a separate status. In that respect, yeah, in a certain sense, the magical folk occupy this hidden, different world. But from another point of view, I mean, Harry was perfectly visible to everybody. It's not as if Harry's like an electron, so nobody can perceive him. And so it's as if, look, they, these people might be ordinary people, except suddenly they have these powers. And so, right, it is as if they suddenly have these superpowers almost like Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or something like that. You've got these people with superhuman abilities, and, and that raises all sorts of interesting questions about that and what sets them apart and what the meaning of that is, and so on. So I think that, you're right to say, that's a very interesting sort of theme that's going on here. Other themes that you do this, yeah? Social capital. Social capital, okay, say more about that. So uh, the social capital that has to be trust and cooperation between the social networks, and so you know, Within a house, they want to succeed at the house vote, so they're going to help each other. But between house competitions, they're not going to be as nice to each other. And then you have the issues of, do you tell professors what you know, like with Harry Potter, knowing that, or assuming that Snape had stolen the stone, does he tell the professor? Or does he try to solve it himself and try to fix the problem by going and getting the stone himself? Okay, good. Yeah, exactly. I think social capital is an important theme. Notice it's the friendship, and you could reframe this as a friendship type of issue. But yeah, it's really Ron and Harry and Hermione managing to stick together and doing things cooperatively that makes them succeed at certain tasks. At the end, the crucial test, really all three of them play a critical role. And so that's an important element. It's really through cooperation that people end up succeeding. And you're right, the whole house system is in a sense designed to create cooperation, but also to create distrust among them. It's as if, you know, these things go hand in hand. Oxford and Cambridge have this sort of setup. Um, Yale and a number of other American colleges do too, where you're in a particular college. And so your allegiance might be, well, yes, in a sense to Yale University, but in a sense to Sullivan College. 
which is where you live and take classes and so on. And the same thing would be true at Oxford, where you might be part of Oriel, let's say, and you're part of Oriel College, and that's a very strong identifier. Now, here we don't tend to do that. The University of Texas is one thing. It's not as if, let's say, the consulting people all live together and take classes together, and then the people in Blanton all live together, and then there are the Jester people, and, and you know, there are these vicious intramural games between Jester and consulting or something like that. Um, but it is a way of building a strong sense of identification within a smaller group. And to some extent, our first year interest groups are attempts to do something like that, though it's a much milder form than what goes on here. But you're right. That kind of attempt to build cooperation, but in part by competition and so on. And then the questions of cooperation versus, uh, you might say, competition, the, the trust versus distrust and so on, all of those are important running pieces of the Other things that you notice, just, just, yeah. Good. Truth does seem to be a really important theme here. And in fact, one way you can see that is not only that, yes, Harry has this sort of whole world that he was unaware of, and suddenly he learns the truth about who he is, and that transforms him. But also, in, this, in the following sort of sense, people are telling lies all through this book, right? So let me jump ahead a little, actually, yeah. Um, give me some examples of lies. In a sense, it's a dumb question, because take almost any incident in the book, and it involves a series of lies. Um, but, you know, people, the nurseries are constantly lying to Harry. And then at the school, people are constantly telling lies about certain things. And in the end, Dumbledore says to Harry the truth. <laughs> it's a beautiful and terrible thing. It should be therefore treated with great caution. And so in the end, yes, you find out part of the truth, but Dumbledore tells him only part of the truth. There are certain questions he won't answer, because truth is something that has a huge impact on people's lives. And so here it's not so much the question of what is the truth, as rather, what is the role of truth? in human affairs, and it's a complicated story. Um, most of us, this book seems to suggest we live our lives in states of more or less constant deception, and not knowing what's really going on. And when you find out what's going on, it can give you great power, but it can also pose a great danger to you. And so in a sense, the truth is like this double-edged sword that can help you and can also really endanger So yeah, I think that's a very important thing. And one way to tell that is to just see that it comes out in the last few pages where there is this serious conversation between Dumbledore and Harry. Other, yes? Uh, relation or in relation to the identity of this woman, Harry, all by himself, like the relation, like what he was talking about, with the Hermione, the Ron, he kind of gets to learn about himself, and also through that friendship, Hermione would learn about more about herself, and actually gain confidence in the religion. Ooh, good, all right. Yes, people's self you might say conceptions of their own identity and the way in which they come to greater self knowledge uh, that tends to happen in the book through personal interaction. But not all, of course, through the right kind. Harry learns a lot about himself, not just from Hagrid, who tells him certain things about himself, but from interacting with Ron, from interacting with Hermione. And they each find out important things about themselves as they go along. And so there is a sort of process of self-discovery here in which your own conception of your identity changes. And, of course, identification as a muggle or as a wizard is a big part of this, but it's only some part. Each person has some characteristic virtues, I think. They also have some shortcomings that are balanced by the virtues of others, and they really learn about themselves in part by those comparisons, interacting and realizing that there are certain weaknesses, certain areas where somebody else is much stronger. And so that's something that does strike me as important about their own, I, not only about their identity, but what, what I say, the way in which human beings develop their own sense of identity. Other themes? Yeah. Destiny. Justice, okay. Destiny. Oh, sorry? Destiny. Destiny, destiny. Destiny, destiny. Oh. Destiny. Ah, oh, yes, okay. How do you see that coming out? Well, because, like, um, everyone, so everyone expects there to be, like, one that is expected to be great. Right. So, like, he has to live up to those expectations. Without that destiny. Ooh. All right, good, good. Yeah, part of the reason I backtracked physically <laughs> when you said that is I said, I know how to make the case for that given the whole series of books. It's harder to make it on the basis of just book one. But yes, Harry's destiny is really important, and it's connected to this question of what is special about him, if anything. 
Um, and so in this book, we can at least ask that. He is the boy who lived. Somehow he survived. And so all these people in the magical world who meet him are your Harry Potter, right? He's famous in that world for something he barely even remembers. And now the question is, well, yeah, is there anything special about him? Was it something that was, as it were, random, having nothing to do with it at all? Was it purely his mother's love? Maybe there's nothing special about Harry as such, but maybe there is. Maybe he really does have a distinct destiny, and perhaps that's because of who he is, but maybe it's just because of that. There's this link between Harry and Voldemort, and that's something that's really crucial to understanding this whole destiny thing and really who he and the end is. So I think you're absolutely right. Those questions are raised here. They aren't really answered in this book. But if you're familiar with the rest of the series, you realize, oh, that's actually crucial to understanding the overall map of things. Yes? Uh, loyalty, and loyalty to people, and then loyalty to good and evil. Good. Yeah, loyalty. Loyalty to particular people, and also loyalty to the good. Uh, one thing that is something that Hagrid says about Voldemort right at the beginning is, look, he was just as bad to the people who were on his side. Um, should have done that in a more accurate. <laughs> yeah. Look, Harry, he wasn't just bad to those of us. Well, Father Dumbledore, he was just as bad to his own friends. Um, and so there is that sense in which, yes, um, loyalty is a crucial question here. Be, and if, if there's anything that is the main virtue of Harry, it might be loyalty. He is somebody who is doggedly loyal to certain people and to certain ideas. Um, and that's something that Hermione and Ron seem to share with you. There is this sense of loyalty, and it's only near the end of the whole series that that begins to come apart and becomes threatened. Um, but really, within this book, that, that is in a sense their main strength, that conception of loyalty. Other themes? Yeah? Desire and its like possible danger. Ooh, desire and its danger. You bet. There's that mirror, the mirror of the wrist, right? That shows you your, deep, your deepest desires. And so here's what Dumbledore says when he's explaining it to Harry. The happiest man on earth would be able to use a mirror of a risen like a normal mirror. That is, he'd look into it and see himself exactly as he is. Why? Because his deepest desire is already fulfilled to be the person he is, okay? And so that's what it really means. It shows us nothing more or less than the deepest, most desperate desire of our hearts. And that change is interesting, right? It's not as if that's one undercurrent that remains constant throughout your life. Initially, when Harry looks in the mirror, what does he see? His parents. His parents. He's there with his parents. And so that's his deepest desire. At the end of the book, what does he see? <coughs> he sees himself with the Sorcerer's Stone. Yeah. And so that's something that changes clearly as time goes on. The deepest and most desperate desire at one moment may be different from what it is at another moment. But it is a danger here. It's not just that desires are good things. I mean, be, his desire to be with his family was a good thing. The desire for the Sun Stone was a good thing. Partly because he didn't want to use it for himself, but Dumbledore, got, you know, warns him it doesn't do to dwell on dreams and forget it. Yeah. Marissa is actually desire backwards. Exactly, it's desire backwards. And if you look at what's written at the top of the thing carefully, it's just um, I show you. Um, actually, I can't <laughs> read that well backwards, but it's basically yeah, I show you your heart's desire. So it's all just yeah, desire backwards. Yes. Yeah. Oh, awesome. How the quest for power makes you lose your humanity. Yes, the quest for power and how it makes you lose your humanity. Power is a very important theme throughout this book. Here is Voldemort. <laughs> there is no good and evil, notice he says. There is only power to those too weak to see it. And so that is his main theme in a way throughout the book. There is no such thing as truth. There's no good or evil. There is only power. And you see him progressively lose his humanity. Um, and become more and more serpent-like, you might say, um, as he becomes dedicated. So, who does that remind you of, by the way? Who would have said there is no such thing as truth, only power? Nietzsche, yeah, this is a very Nietzschean idea. By the way, people have asked Rowling, so who did you have in mind for Voldemort? I mean, who were the, the role models here? <laughs> and her answer is basically Hitler and Stalin. Um, they were the people she had in mind as reflecting this idea, not really having a different conception of good and evil, but instead rejecting good and evil as categories altogether and seeking power instead. And, and so Voldemort here is meant to represent that sort of totalitarian 
bloodthirsty dictator. But if you think about the name, Baltimore, um, it's really old French for willing death. Okay, not his own, of course, but willing death for others. Okay, anything else you can see as a theme? Yes? Existentialism. How so? Oh, well, all right. Um, I don't know about existentialism here, uh, in a larger sense of the theme, but the absurd, there are certain things you could describe as confrontations with the absurd here, right? And what are some of them? Say it again. Oh, yeah, okay, good. One person suddenly appearing elsewhere. <laughs> Other things that seem absurd. Well, the fact that, like... Right, Well, all right, the whole idea, yes, I mean, the whole idea of magic you might think of as absurd. But what I was thinking of is, you're right, if it, the things that are resulting from that, if you don't understand what's going on, um, appear absurd. Like the fact that they're in the, the zoo, for example, looking at the snake, and all of a sudden the glass melts, right? And, and there the snake gets out, and Dudley is terrified and so on. That seems like an absurd phenomenon. Everybody comes over and like, where did the glass go? So there are confrontations with absurdity like that. And it happens in the magical world too. In a sense, there are all these things that seem unintelligible. And it's not until you get down further that you sort of start seeing what's happening and understanding this. But the very, from a, from a level point of view, yes, the existence of magic seems very, by itself, absurd. But what it does is constantly produce these effects that seem absurd. Well, there are a few other things I noticed. One is love, of course. His mother's love is what protected him from Baltimore. Uh, that's the one thing Baltimore cannot understand. Uh, what is death? What is this all about? The Sorcerer's Stone, the Philosopher's Stone, the thing that produces the elixir of life that grants people immortality. And also wealth, by the way. It turns metals into gold, so it gives you as much money and life as you could want. Uh, Baltimore's greatest fear is his own death. But Dumbledore, at the end, is talking about Nicholas Flamel and how he's now going to die since they've destroyed the stone. And he says, well, it's really like going to bed after a very, very long day. After all, the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. So there's a lot about death, people's desire to avoid death, um, a willingness to accept death, and so forth. And one last one, rules. Okay, for certain people are making rules. Filch, for example, but others, the nurses, and so on. And Harry is a great rule breaker. He goes around breaking rules all the time. The Weasley twins break rules all the time. And so, in a certain sense, I think there's a theme here about rules being there to be disobeyed. Okay? Um, 